presentation today is going to be on the immune system and support of the immune system. Please feel free at any time to raise your hand or just put out a question if you have something to ask uh, regarding what I just said. Sometimes I may answer that a little bit later uh, as we go into the presentation, but please feel comfortable to do that. This talk is about a natural approach to supporting the immune system. And as retailers and the small neighborhood retailers, you have the opportunity to have the knowledge to provide that to your customers that come in that a lot of the big stores are not able to provide. And you have a great opportunity to be precise on what you're selling as far as the quality of the materials that you're selling. And that, I think, goes from everything from food all the way down to you name it, it works, to the toys that you sell. These are the major issues that bring patients into the veterinarian's office, and I'm sure these are the same issues that bring customers into your store. They're looking for joint health, they're looking for condition problems with the coat, hot spots that occur, digestive issues, which is a really big issue, and of course oral health issues. I do want to tell you that Horn has provided the slide deck on their website and you're able to download it and, and have it for, for record. You know, nutrition is a key factor into our immune system. You think about it, what we take in is going to have some effect on our body, not only to every organ, but to every cell in our body. And that starts with what we ingest. Critical to what we ingest is what we do with it once it's inside our bodies. And that's, that's the digestive factors. And then, you know, we can digest it, but are we absorbing it? Is it a molecule that we can pick up and be utilized by the body? And then what do we do about it? We have to get rid of it. So if any one of these processes is not working, we have an issue that may lead to a health issue. When I say we, I'm talking about us. Everything we talk about applies to us, but we're, we're, we're basically here to talk about dogs and cats. So what is really critical with in ingestion is species-appropriate food. You know, if you look how animals eat in the wild, a, a cat really doesn't eat grains and corn and fillers and so forth. What do they usually do when they find a rabbit and they, they kill the rabbit and eat it? They bite off the head. They don't eat the stomach. They don't eat the intestines. Cat's teeth are only tearing teeth, just much like the dog. <laughs> as well. So when you're feeding a cat a grain-based diet or a low meat protein diet, you are suddenly disrupting the digestive enzymes, the way the stomach processes, the way the intestines process, and then how the body utilizes those nutrients and how the body eliminates it. So these things then become toxins that affect cells on, this, on, on a very minute cellular level. So when we look at cats, they're carnivores. They eat meat, and that's all they should be fed. Canines, dogs, they have a little gray area there. You won't see a dog attack a cornfield. But they will eat stomachs of the animals that they may kill in the wild. And in that stomach, there could be corn, there could be grain, there could be, it's usually green grasses mostly. And so they can process a little bit better than than a uh, cat for sure. But if you look at it, the dog's teeth are just tearing teeth. So ingredients in the food that you sell in your store, in my opinion, are, are critical. How those are processed when they're being made is another issue. I'm getting a little feedback over here. Let me know if, if, if that happens and it's annoying. How that food is processed is critical because in food there should be digestive enzymes that help us integrate this protein so that we can break it down and utilize it. When we process food, we change the dynamic, we change it on a molecular level, and that eventually over a period of time will affect how our body utilizes it and how our body becomes nourished by it. I love raw foods. Raw foods provide one of the greatest things and that's digestive enzymes and it starts in the mouth. You know, we chew our food. We translate when we chew. We open our mouths, we close and we slide. We open, close and slide. 
So we start that salivary process that begins in digestion. Dogs and cats don't do that. They don't translate. So, so dogs and cats don't chew their food. They gnaw it, they break it down, they, they grind it, for, not grind it, but but um, that's the word I'm looking for. Tear it, that's the word I'm looking for. They, they'll tear their food and swallow it. And that is a, there's a big difference in how their digestive process begins as a result of that. You know, hydration is extremely critical. Animals and dogs and cats are not so about 70% water. As the earth, well actually we're about 75, the earth's about 70. Critical factor because the water helps to, one thing, move things around. When, when somebody has a bowel problem, and you have a dog or yourself that suddenly has diarrhea, What's happening is there's something in there that's pulling water out of the cells and into your intestinal tract. And that intestinal, that amount of water that's being pulled is what really creates the diarrhea. Also a big indicator that your body is trying to excrete a toxin that it can't handle. And that could be something as simple as an improper food fed to a cat or a dog. There's a difference between structure of water and the types of water that we drink. And I'll go into a little greater detail later but H2O, we all know, is water. Structured water, which is a more alkaline water, we call H3O now, because your body's able to absorb it. Tap water is usually about neutral in that pH, and bottled water is anywhere, the average bottle of water is anywhere from neutral to an acidic uh, form, about 6'4", 6'5", 6'7", 6'8", somewhere in there depending on the manufacturer of the water. So we all here, we want to eat protein. Our dogs need protein, our cats need protein. But you know what, our body doesn't really need protein, doesn't really say, I want some protein. The body takes the protein and breaks it down into amino acids. And amino acids is actually what provide us with our nutrients. So your dog could eat a piece of meat and your neighbor's dog can eat the other half of that same piece of meat, and those amino acids will be broken down and restructured by that individual animal according to what it needs. So the, the, the key factor isn't protein, it's quality of protein and then what the animal, or what you do with that protein, and how your body utilizes it and uses it and restructures it to, to give you the nutrients that you need. So the key factor here is amino acids and quality protein. When you see illness, and when you see hot spots, or loss of fur in animals, you can always look to the main cause being dysbiosis, which is a late-term leaky gut. And that's actually microscopic holes in your intestinal tract. So for example, you have customers that come in with dog allergies and the veterinarians see a ton of this at specific periods of the year. And you'll say, well, there's pollen in the air and uh, the dogs are reacting to it. Or there's new grasses that they're running through and they're reacting to the proteins from those grasses. But what really happens is these microscopic holes, this leaky gut syndrome that we call it, allows proteins to leak out of the gut and to go places in the blood and other areas and tissues and your body now has a histamine reaction to those proteins because those proteins are now in a place where they shouldn't be. So the idea of keeping the gut healthy, which again starts with the quality food, your species-specific food, is critical. So we'll talk a little bit further about the leaky gut. We know that we move food through peristaltic action. And what that is, is like the wave at a baseball game. If somebody stands up and then the whole stadium makes a wave, that's how our intestinal tract processes our food. And it starts with the saliva in our mouth. Without hydration, you can't produce the saliva. That's number one. Without this peristalsis, that food layers in your body and eventually begins to rot and becomes toxic. So if you're looking at 
let's say, a grain-based diet for a dog, and that's what the dogs are being fed, you have two things that can happen there. You have food that can be processed out of the body quicker because the grains, the fiber, will pull in water in the intestinal tract, and maybe those proteins aren't being broken down into those amino acids because it's not in the digestive system long enough. Or you have uh, the protein stagnant in there and rotting, and then now you'll be having toxins being given, given off. So there's two issues that happen when the food isn't correct. Digestive enzymes are one of the best things that help that. And as a neighborhood store, pet store, you could have an area that has quality digestive tract, uh, digestive enzymes that you can sell to your clients to help this process along. So again, hydration is, is very, very critical to the process of absorption, digestion, and elimination, as is physical movement. What, what does everybody do after they feed their dog? They want to take them for a walk because the muscular action starts the process of elimination and your dogs want to do it as well. So that's a very key factor in, in our uh, digestive process. And again, the food ingredient quality, that, that, that to me is paramount. Question? What, what, one second, please. They'll give you a microphone. We hear all kinds of things about having your dog exercise right after they eat, and I know you're talking about are you talking immediately get them out and exercise? I have shepherds and I know they have prone to bloat and I've always said wait. So I just want to clarify that. Some species, some, some breeds of dogs are a little more prone to, to bloat, of course. And when that food is in there and you do take a dog out, it, it can accelerate that because it's accelerating. I'm sorry? Is it better to wait then? It, it is better to wait a little bit, but it, you know, your dog will tell you. Your dog will tell you if, if you want to get out, if it wants to get out and walk and start that process, you know. But, you know, blo bloat is always an issue, but I would tell you bloat happens because of a lack of digestive process, lack of enzymes. Could, it could even be the food that they're having a problem with, you know. That leaky gut syndrome is an issue. With blood. You know, we all have a thyroid, our dogs and cats have a thyroid, and this thyroid, this little gland that's right in the neck, is probably the most critical organ you have in your body because nothing functions properly when this doesn't function properly. And it's probably, in the human field alone, it's the most undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, misunderstood organ that we have, and that's, that's exponential in the animal field. So without a proper thyroid, your cells cannot operate at the, at the function that they're meant to happen, and you don't have my metabolism. What is metabolism? Metabolism is the making of energy by the use of those amino acids that the body is trying to make, as well as simple sugars and, and a number of other components. So without the thyroid working, metabolism doesn't happen. All of our cells operate at a particular voltage. Without a proper thyroid function, you cannot hold that voltage. You cannot hold the oxygen on a cellular level. So if the cells don't have oxygen, you don't have energy, you have, you have a lethargic animal, you have a maybe a jittery animal, an angry animal, whatever, because it can all be traced back to a low functioning thyroid. Another organ is, that's not often thought of is the liver, but the liver is probably our, our main filtering system, even above and beyond the kidneys. But it also does more than filter toxins out of our body. It makes certain components, such as bile for digestion, such as this thing called glutathione, and glutathione is our master antioxidant. And we hear of, about oxidation, and oxidation is really rust inside the body, inside the cell. And without a functioning liver, or a non-sludgy liver, a, a liver that's, that's developing fat in it, because, again, you can trace a lot of it back to diet, in fact, most of it back to diet, you can't produce this glutathione, the master antioxidant. So you could say, well, I take vitamin C, which we know is an antioxidant, or I take vitamin E, or I take vitamin A. None of these work without glutathione. 
and glutathione allows for, for second and third passes of those other antioxidants that actually work. So you have this combination of glutathione and these other antioxidants to stop that rusting process or that form of oxidation, which creates free radicals, which create inflammation, which creates damage, which creates illness. So you see how that cycle works? And if we're supporting the improper cycle, we're supporting illness. We're, we're causing illness to develop. So glutathione is it, so critical also in the cleaning of the, of the liver. So glutathione has its own full circle. So it's an important thing. Can you go out and take glutathione? I wouldn't recommend it because most of the glutathione supplements, are, the particle size is too large and your body can't utilize it. But we'll talk a little bit later about how your body synthesizes glutathione. And again, that's going to go back to, to what we're taking in and the quality of protein and so forth. There are some glutathione that, that you can supplementally take. Supplementally take. Again, these digestive enzymes are critical for digestion. Protein only gets broken down by a digestive enzyme called protease, starch by amylase, cellulose by cellulase, and fats or lipids by lipase. So if you have a heavily processed food that can, contains grains, which is starch and sugars, or high in cellulose, and, or fats even, and fats are a critical, critical component to the wellness. <coughs> If these enzymes are not in the food and in the quantities that we need, our bodies, our animals' bodies are not breaking them down. So again, another wonderful di uh, supplement that could be sold in your stores to help digestion, ultimately helping wellness. Probiotics. Again, probiotics help the digestive process. They help make other vitamins. They, they make some B vitamins, in fact. And, and it really, it, it isn't the number, you'll hear 10 million, 20 million, 50 million, whatever. It's the, the different species that can bind together to, to, that is important. So, oh, I give my dog a little bit of yogurt. Well, a little bit of yogurt has bacifitus in it, maybe, maybe one other one in there. It's not harming, of course, it may give a little bit of help, but it's not really doing what it needs to be done. You need to have a variety of, of bacteria, so-called good bacteria, for that to, to process to actually work. And then there should be support for that, what we call prebiotic, for that support. And this is only a small listing. And, you know, we can't go in a short amount of time into great detail here. It's, I'm trying to, to give you some education to inspire you to look into this further. But this is critical. Yes, sir. I'm struck by the fact that there are a lot of similarities between human and animal wellness. What, what wonderful point. That, I, that may be you, Luke. Uh, also, the fact that pet parents like to sometimes treat their animals better than themselves. Guilty. Okay. How can we benefit from this knowledge of similarity and nutrition? I'm going to tell you, that, that, that's me, that I'm, going to, I'm going to kind of slide over here so that you guys don't hear that. Um, we aren't any different than our animals. You think about it. That dog has two eyes, two kidneys, one liver, one heart, two lungs, has emotions, has wants, has have needs. We're not that different. There are some critical areas that have more been generational. And what I mean by that is, we've kind of gone into a domesticated diet, a domesticated lifestyle, and over the, over the centuries, we've had things that we've ingested and our body has adapted. A lot of that hasn't happened to animals because animals were yard beings. Dogs and cats were out in the barn, in the yard, and they weren't fed even dog food. Dog food didn't come into the, to the 40s. And it, it came in as, they lived off a of scrap, you know, or wild kill, or whatever. So they're not as adapted to some of the toxins that we are. And then they have smaller liver, livers and smaller kidneys, so they can't process all of that. And we're larger and, and so forth. But the key factors to their wellness 
are the same key factors to your wellness. And it's pretty much what we're going over. And that was a great question. So this thyroid immunity is, is critical. Our thyroid regulates, like I said before, every cell in our body. And what it does is it creates, we're an electrical being. We can measure that. I have a device that can actually measure key components of electricity on a cellular level. When our thyroid doesn't work, we can't hold the voltage. When we don't hold the voltage, we can't hold the oxygen. So we go from an alkalinity state in our cellular level to an acidic state. The short story is most microbes, most, most pathogenic organisms wake up in an unoxygen anaerobic acidic environment. So the key thing is to, to keep, keep your thyroid healthy or to have it diagnosed properly. A little more difficult because you're not clinicians, but you can you see a, a, an animal that comes into your store, an owner comes in and says, well, my, what do you have for hot spots? Start to think for a second. Well, you know, you could trace that maybe all the way back to thyroid. And you can certainly trace it back to digestive issues. So this potential hydrogen that we call pH is critical. I was always kind of taught or told that our dogs have a, a very acidic stomach, more acidic than ours and we're, we're more alkaline, but it, actually the truth is reversed. Dogs are more alkaline in the mouth and in the stomach than we are. Our pH alkalinity should be about 735, 745, right in that range, or 7. It varies according to what style you look, but right around in there. Dogs are about 0.2% higher than that. Interesting, because what do we do? We we give our dogs grain that they can handle. I mean, for years, that's what dogs food did, dog food did. And we take that alkalinity that they need and we turn it into very acidic. They're meant to eat protein, meat protein. Meat protein is very acidic. But their body's so alkaline that they're me it's meant to compensate for it. We, we over acidify them and then they start having problems. So, the problem with testing for thyroid in a clinician's office, in a doctor's office, is that generally TSH and T4, total T4 is tested, and those aren't very accurate. There are a whole list of human blood tests that they don't do for animals that are much more accurate if you find a clinician that knows what they're doing. But if they come back with a very low TSH, very low, I'm saying, on the scale, you, you know that there's a thyroid issue. But there are other signs. If a client comes in, if a customer comes in and says, you know, my dog's lethargic, doesn't want to eat very often, plays with his food, eats a little bit, walks away, uh, doesn't want to play, doesn't wag his tail when I come in the room. There's a health issue going on, and you can then look at that health, health issue going all the way back to the thyroid. You could, you could say, well, you know, if that was my dog, because you, of course, don't want to tell anybody what to do, but if that was my dog, I might want to have a thyroid check. Alkalinity holds oxygen. Oxygen is how and why we live. We live. For example, if a dog had, was suffering with a cancer issue, if a human was suffering with a cancer issue, I would look right away to low functioning thyroid, I would look to low oxygen, oxygen in the body, and I would look to a very acidic being. You can reverse all of that. Iodine, I would never tell anybody to start giving to their dog. Um, iodine, or to yourself, but iodine is what your thyroid utilizes for this hormone that's being made. So are these other supportive components, selenium, iron, zinc, vitamin C, and sulfur, MSM, methyl sulfur, and methane. Our bodies are 25% sulfur. I've never found a study that's ever analyzed what the dog's percentage of sulfur is. But I've got to tell you, it mimics ours pretty closely, in my opinion. Glutathione, progesterone, and cortisol are all made by your body, but they're only made by your body when your body's being supported with the proper nutrients. So these key components here help to keep the thyroid working, and then that, that helps to make every cell in your body work. 
iodine is in certain foods in small amounts. If I was to suggest iodine for an animal, I would do it in the form of kelp in a very low dose. But I wouldn't want to do that without knowing what the thyroid is. Liver and kidney function. Any one of these goes away, you die. Unlike a heart of cardiac arrest that may take you out immediately, these two things make you suffer for a long time. And what happens is they're filtering all of our toxins in our body. And when we toxin overload, they get overloaded. The, the nephrons in the kidney become destroyed. They become scarred. Liver becomes generally fatty, or it could become necrotic even. And it's a slow, painful death. Nice thing is liver is very easy to, to reverse. Kidney, not so easy. This glutathione that I spoke of a moment ago is made by three amino acids. And I have them listed there. And those are made by eating meat. You don't get these three amino acids in, in vegetable proteins. They're made from animal source protein. So vegans, if they're not supplementing with some form of glutathione, they're, they're deficient in these key amino acids. SAMI, how many have heard of SAMI? SAMI is a precursor to the making of glutathione. It's a forerunner. And there are a number of forerunners. N-acetylcysteine, vitamin C, vitamin B, milk thistle, burdock root, dandelion root, will all help with, as precursors to the making of glutathione. And then they have other multi-purposes. Now glutathione clears the liver, so does milk, milk thistle. They both help the liver regenerate cells. Burdock root and dandelion help the liver, help the, help the kidneys. So there's a, th these things help to support wellness. There is a product, and again, I'm, I'm not recommending it, I just want to make you aware of it. It's called Denosil, and there are a couple other brands that are out there now within the last four or five years. And what that is, is s or SAMe, dosed properly by weight for the animal. Most veterinarians know about it, but don't prescribe it very much. But we all know xylitol is toxic. We all know xylitol is toxic to our dogs, gut wounds, the kidneys. High doses of glutathione re reverse the toxicity and the damage of xylitol ingestion. So the vets sell it at a very high rate, of course, in their offices when they do prescribe it. And you have the, the sense that it's a prescription. It is not. Anybody can access it online. Any retailer can sell it. It's, it's sold by weight, and it's dosed accordingly. It's a, it's a very good thing to, to help this production of glutathione and help keep the liver healthy. So just be aware of that. Uh, vitamin D I want to speak of uh, for a moment here. We all have animals. What happens sometimes when the animal sees a spot of sun and, wants to go, and they run away and want to go sit in it. it. Absolutely. They instinctively know that in that, that by doing that, they're feeling better somehow. That's why they constantly repeat it. They're producing vitamin D the same way that we produce vitamin D. Vitamin D is critical from everything from thyroid function to our immune system to even fighting cancers. Well established, no controversy. Too much vitamin D, three in particular, actually will shut the thyroid down. It stops production at D1. But we need a good dose of vitamin D. If, it's, if you live north of the 39th parallel, you're, you're not getting the D. If you're clothed all the time, if you're not laying naked in the sun for 20 minutes, you're not getting D. So supplemental D, quality supplemental D is there. And there are products of quality, specifically for animals. We talked about the amino acids. These two in particular, and they're incorporated in a lot of supplements as well, help to perform, to produce something that almost works like a natural peroxide that helps oxygenate and, and 
kill viruses and bacteria and so forth. I just want to make you aware of it. Vitamin C does the same thing. Vitamin C and vitamin and uh, glutathione are in some really nice forms now called liposomal forms that are able to be fully absorbed about 85 percent in the body there aren't any animal ones that i could find that are being marketed specifically for animal but when when i have a consultation from clients that that i think that this would help and i do think that it helps overall all the time i say hey get them from a you know a human health provider uh, a health store or whatever because the qualities there. You have to be concerned. Some of them have alcohol in there, and I never suggest grain alcohol for any dog or any cat whatsoever. Some of them have high sodium in there, and you've got to watch that because they can't process that sodium in high amounts at one time. We've all heard of colostrum. Colostrum is the first milking of a calf, and it's for sort of the next. 11 days, 10, 12 days, two weeks, somewhere in there. There are certain immune factors that are in the, produced by that animal, by ourselves, in that period of time, that are in that colostrum that really support the immune system. And they, the colostrum does everything from uh, help gum tissue heal to, to fight off infections. It works a little differently in animals than it does in us. We have we have a, a, uh, a, a different form, the way it approaches, but it ends up doing the same way. There's an IgA and an IgG, and we're a little bit different than animals, what we produce. But this kind of, a, kind of adapts and modifies for both of us. We talked about probiotics. Medicinal mushrooms, beta-glucan, reishi, and shiitake mushrooms are such extraordinary products for you and for the animals. And there are, there are and they put us in the talk as well, there are supplements that you can buy that have these in there that are, that are marketed for animals. If not, I say get them from a human store and dose them accordingly to my weight. Uh, my friend Tony has a holistic pet store, all natural, and you sell things like this. And the demand is really great for it. Healthy, healthy pet products. I, I think that if I could change one thing, it would be diet. The quality of diet, that would be my first thing. Supporting that is where the nutraceuticals come in. I, did you hear the question about nutraceuticals? Um, Luke, what they told me was, well, they said, just don't turn it on in front of the speaker. Right. Um, I look at nutraceuticals not as nutrition, but as body support. So you're augmenting the nutrition. The nutrition quality is the basis for everything. Going back to what we ingest, absorb, digest, and eliminate. So do I take supplements? Do I give my dog supplements daily? I may skip a day every once in a while because it, it creates a little bit of a demand by the body again. So uh, absolutely. Uh, No grains. I, I've given no grains whatsoever to my dogs. They get some plant. They get some. They get some plants, and they definitely get a quality uh, protein. Non-GMO. I mean, I, I didn't talk about GMOs, and I'm not going to do that today. But um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's all about the quality of what we're getting. We're giving. And when you made the statement about. Uh, they're overall they're healthy. I would tell you that a grain-fed dog or cat is not healthy, and it, it's just a time bomb ticking away. Omega-3 fatty acids, important. Body needs them. DHA works very heavily in the brain. EPA, very good for the joints. They do a ton of other things, but those are probably the two main focuses on that. So we want a healthy, happy brain. We don't want a cripple dog. So, uh, again, we, we quality product. A lot of products will have good things in them, and then they put fillers and other other things. So, 
you have to be discriminative to know what you're offering your clients. The macronutrients, the proteins, the carbohydrates, the fats, the, the, the minerals are so critical. Most diseases have an underlying factor of lack of minerals. The minerals do a lot for our body in the alkalization process and they do a lot in the supportive process. So things such as vitamins, which we call organic compounds, or, or, and other vital nutrients like the, the antioxidants, and the, the things that prevent the free radicals, or the vitamin C's, A's, D's, E's, they're all, they're all critical. You don't, those are generally fat-soluble, not C's, although they have a form of fat-soluble C now. So you don't want to high dose it. The problem a lot occurs when they're lacking in the diet. And you know, you can go to a grocery store and buy junk food and think you're feeding your dog something good and everything's okay. And, and people say, well, I'm not spending the money on, on the food, but the average person then spends it on the bed and gross at some point. Not to mention the trauma of the animal or the emotional trauma for yourself because you're, you're dealing with a sick, a sick animal that you care and love. So the, these things like the, the inorganic compound minerals, and I only used a couple examples, magnesium, calcium, big believer in the proper form of magnesium, not a big believer in calcium whatsoever. These trace elements are, are, are incredible, zinc, copper, iron, very low doses. Antioxidants, we talked about those, we're kind of running out of time here soon, I want to have a question and answer period at the end, so. Adaptogens, which are plant-based, plant your body utilizes them, you give them, your body doesn't need it, the body doesn't utilize them. It, it, it's really that simple. The, the body will take, will take those adaptogens and extract from it what it needs and eliminate what it doesn't. And, and I, so a few examples of, of adaptogens are there. Again, there are companies out there that are producing those. This milk thistle, burdock root, we talked about. D mannose is a sugar, non-insulin activating sugar. D mannose, great for the heart, great for the liver, great for the kidneys, great for the cells. Cranberry extract, pure cran, not cranberry juice, but cranberry extract. An animal that has a urinary tract infection, I'm not even going to the causes for that, but that alone will help prevent that bacteria from sticking to the urethra and, and causing the problem. So it's, it, it's just a, it's a cranberry and it has all these medicinal capabilities. Inflammation, at the root of all disease, disease creates inflammation, inflammation creates disease. These are some of the things that, that are very helpful. Co uh, enzyme Q10, it's in every animal, it's in every one of us as we age, we tend to make less of it, and I think we make less of it because our diet becomes worse as we age. But it's essential, it helps with gum disease, it helps with your heart, it's just an amazing, amazing uh, supplement. Cod liver, uh, cod liver oil I'm not that popular, uh, fond of because the vitamin A content may be a little bit too, too high to smaller dogs, so I, I tend not to recommend cod liver oil, although you can, you can find it sold for pets. But you can also find pet products with xylitol in it. Vita this is a critical, I'm, we're almost out of time and I'm gonna run through it. The methylation is like this. If I take a copy, a photograph, and I make a copy of that, that photograph, and then I take that copy and make a copy, then I take that copy and I make 100 more copies, by the time I get to the 100th copy, you, you can't see very clearly. It's, it's a haze, fuzzy copy. So you always wanna be, wanna be copying the original. This is called methylation. That's a, that's a short term of a uh, description of it. Without B12, and I say methylcobalamin form of B12, and other vitamin B complexes, this methylation process does not happen. So when you're so on a DNA level, when that DNA is is restruct is recopying itself, without the process of methylation, you're getting that hundredth copy. And so then you want what is cancer? Cancer is nothing more than a broken DNA bond where the methylation process has stopped and the bonds, the bonds can't produce, reproduce the way they should be reproducing. So there are other forms of this uh, methylfolate, um, even a supplement called TMG, which goes by another name, uh, betaine, will help 
process this meth this methylation process. So bees are bees are important for your immune system is the underlying story here. Well, I, I thank you so much for coming. I, I do want to make another comment. Uh, Horn, uh, so appreciative of Horn for allowing me to come here and share this with you. And they do a wonderful job. Horn does. I'm going to tell a quick story. I do a lecture on oral care, and I. I Bought this product, tried it on my dogs and loved it. And uh, I always experiment on myself, so I used it to brush my teeth. So what I did was, I had my teeth cleaned professionally. I used the gel, that, well, this is the spray. I used the gel on my toothbrush, and I used the spray on uh, intermittently throughout the day. And I waited three months, and I build up on calculus because I'm a mouth breather. So there'll be cer certain areas of my teeth that I build this this hard calculus on that has to be scraped away professionally and I go in every two months as a, because of that well I extended it a third month and I just do the only thing I changed was the use of these products went to my hygienist who, who looked at me and said what what did you do what are you experimenting with because I'm always doing something and she said I said well you tell me what you see because I was a little afraid she was going to say you know look how terrible this is or whatever she said there's not one speck of calculus anywhere on your teeth. There is no uh, redness in your gums, they're pink and healthy. So then I got a big smile on my face because I can say this. So I sent an email, I don't know this company, I don't know the owners, I don't know what they do, but I gotta tell you, I'm, I, I'm a big supporter of, of this company. I sent them an email with my testimonial, testimony, uh, what's, I, I'm not thinking right now, testimonial, and um, they sent me about, we send you some samples. And I said, well, I'm gonna be at SuperZoo and I'd be happy to share the samples. And they sent me, and it had to be $5,000 worth of retail of samples. So I, I would like anyone that didn't attend the lecture yesterday to come and grab a bottle of each of those. What you may wanna look into, because this is their company as well, and I know Tony sells these products, um, and, and I've talked to her a few years ago about, about my fondness of them. Uh, I didn't make the association of this product line with this, but um, I've been using these and they, they're all organic, they're all human grade, they're, I give these to my animal. Everything you see up here is what I've utilized for my animals over time. And it happens to be the same company and they sent me a few samples though, so there aren't many to go around. So anybody in the retail business that would like to, to experience them, please, uh, I'll give you a bottle. Um, I want you to know I have no affiliation with them, no financial, any arrangement. Yeah. It, it, when I, I do a TV show that you can see online called, it's now called Healthy Pets, Healthy Owners. Uh, you can archive them. It used to be called Let's, Let's Talk Healthy Pets. And um, I, I don't often recommend a lot of things, but when I see success with something and the quality is there and the storyline is good, why they doing what they're doing, I recommend them. So as retailers, I suggest that we do that. Thank you so much for coming. Any questions? Yes. So uh, the, meat, the meats, how are you sure where the quality of meat comes from, what the, they are fed? As a, re as, a re as a retailer, I, I, I think you're obligated to speak to the manufacturer directly and to get it in writing. Because often, I'll see something that says uh, no MSG or no MSG added, which means there's MSG in there. And I'll call the manufacturer and they'll say, well, there's no MSG. And I'll say, well, let me talk to so-and-so. And then they'll say, no, we don't add MSG. And I'll say, well, it is, is, do you, is this free glutamate? Oh, yeah, that's free glutamate. Well, free glutamate is the rawest form of MSG, a neural toxin. So you have to, so, I, I know Tony does this. Um, Tony and I are from the same hometown. She goes to the manufacturer and discusses their processes and so forth. So I, I, I think you're obligated to do that as a retailer itself. I mean, you know, you want to stay in business, you want to sell product, but when you have quality products and you're educating your customers why this one costs ten dollars and this one only costs a dollar fifty, you know, they're they're going to shoot for that ten dollars and you're going to stay in business. You're, you're how many stores now? Three stores, and she started with a with a little local store. 
because people are coming and seeing the results because of the quality of the products that she's done. So. Any other questions? Uh, thank you so much for coming. You know, I'll be